Hi, welcome to Financial Juneteenth, where we encourage black economic empowerment through financial literacy, entrepreneurship, and combating workplace discrimination. I am Dr. Boyce Watkins, but who I am doesn't matter nearly as much as the wonderful young lady that I have on the line with me today. Her name is Yolanda Spivey. Now, you might know Yolanda uh, from her other name in her alternative universe, which is Bianca White. Now, Bianca White is a was a character that Yolanda created uh, in order to test the job market. Yolanda had uh, had some trouble finding job opportunities, and uh, she found that companies weren't calling her back. So she said, "I wonder if if I had a, a you know a white woman's name, if I changed my voicemail, if I changed some things around to make people think they were talking to a white woman, would that change?" And she actually found that the phones started ringing off the hook. Everybody wanted to talk to her. She suddenly became popular because she took the same credentials and put them inside the body of a white woman. And this article blew up. She got hundreds, hundreds of thousands of reads on this article. Uh, Tom Joyner interviewed her about it as well as many other media outlets because she confirmed the existence of the boogeyman of racism that no one else believes is there, but we know it's very real. The black unemployment statistics, statistics kind of show this. Uh, so first I want to ask uh, Yolanda, how are you doing today? I am doing well, Dr. Boyce. Thank you for having me. Well, you know what? I'm so glad to have you. And I, you know, I respect you and I appreciate you so much because uh, you and I actually started working together when you wrote that article and you sent it over to us and you asked us to publish it. We, we didn't know it was going to blow up like this, but it really did because a lot of people identified with what you were going through. Yes, yes, they did. And a lot of people actually emailed and congratulated me for writing that article because I spoke the words they wanted to speak. That they were, you know, afraid to speak. So mm. now, speaking of that fear, uh, sometimes being an, outsp- an outspoken black person can hurt your job prospects. Is that has that been your experience in, in terms of what you've seen? Oh yes, oh definitely. Because of that article, it kind of barred me even further from getting employment. Mm. So I think it kind of hurt my chances of ever working in corporate America ever again. So well, you know. Um, it's, it's uh, I'm writing down notes here because I, I just I want to make sure I don't forget these things. But I, I would say it's almost like uh, Neo in the Matrix. It's like Welcome to the Real World. Remember Morpheus, Barry Fishburne said he said Welcome to the Real World, and and I would say Welcome to Life Off the Plantation. Uh, you congratulations, you are no longer fit for slavery, and uh, and your life will be better because of it. Now we know though at the same time that freedom is not free. Uh, there is a cost that has to be paid to be free. If you think about the first slaves who got off the plantation, uh, their problems were just beginning in certain ways. They had to deal with uh, finding uh, food to eat, finding a place to live, finding ways to put clothes on the backs of their children, uh, of dealing with the Ku Klux Klan, dealing with the, the, the legal restrictions that it kept them from voting and, and building wealth and doing all the things they were trying to do. But they were able to survive. And part of the way they survived was by supporting each other, by working together. And so that's one of the reasons why I think people should support you, because you have actually uh, moved on to a better life. You are now a CEO of Michael <laughs> Whitney, Michael Whitney Asso- and Associates, yes. and that is an insurance firm. Uh, can you tell me a- about that transition? Uh, so, so you went from uh, struggling in the, in, the, in the 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 market for the unemployed to actually having a business now where you're selling insurance, and you told me the business is doing quite well. Tell me about it. Yes. Um, now we finally took a turn <laughs> for the better. <laughs> but you know, I opened the business in 2012, right after I experienced that whole Bianca White situation, after I wrote the article, and it went viral. So I decided to open up my own insurance thing. I pulled all my resources. It was tough. As I had no money, I didn't have basically any support. And I really, you know, I've been, what I did though, Dr. Boyce, is what is important is that I researched how to open up my firm. Like for 10 years, I was researching and writing things down as I went along. And so finally, when I got the guts to finally do it, um, you know, I went to that list that I made and I just started to check off what it was that I needed to open up my business from that list. And I was able to do so in 2012. Hmm. So did you find that, that being a black woman uh, in, in business for herself made it a little tougher to get clients than, than it was when you were working for a big white corporation trying to do the same thing? Yes. No one is so funny. It's the stigma that follows you around that when you're black, 
you don't know your stuff, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. And so people think that you're not, you know, savvy enough to um, sell them a product. And it's so funny because when I when while when I worked in corporate America, people trusted me. They actually trusted me to sell them products because maybe I had like a big name behind me, like Allstate or State Farm or something like that. So they trusted that I knew my stuff then. But when I opened up Michael Whitney, they didn't think I knew. Well, they thought I didn't know my stuff. So, mm. but yeah. so 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 it was tough at the beginning. And yes, it, it was. It got better. What what, what happened? What changed that uh, took you from you know having a struggling small business to one that's actually growing and 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 really doing much better than it was before? What changed was me. I changed. Um, when I first started my business, I hid behind the business. I told people that I was a senior broker. I didn't tell them that I owned the business. I told people that I had an insurance firm. Um, but I still hid behind it. I really didn't showcase myself out there. And what happened was I started telling people, look, I own this business. You know, this is me, you know, and I started approaching people also for their business instead of just saying, Hey, I sell insurance, you know, come to me. No, no, no. I started to break out of my shell and I approached people and then they opened up. They opened up to me, so hmm. that was that was amazing. So, where did you get the idea to start approaching people to get their business? Did that just come to you? Did you try it and it worked, or did, some, did someone make that suggestion to you? No, no one really made the suggestion. But I would say this, Dr. Boyd, it comes from really working with you and the Black Your Black World organization, because through you guys, I was you know we had like a whirlwind. We had so much fun the last two years. Yes, and we have. through you guys, I was able to. Yes, I was just able to open up to so many people. Me telling that Bianca White story, because before I was so shy, I used to not. I didn't put myself out there. I really didn't. But working with you guys, writing articles, you know, people being on television and radio, different radio stations, it kind of opened me up just a little bit to be a little bit more vulnerable and you know, transparent and so. I'm out here now. <laughs> you know? well, well, I loved it. I mean, and, and you, I mean, you, you went from a person that didn't do uh, much media at all to suddenly yeah. doing a lot of media because that, that Bianca White article that you wrote really spoke to so many people in terms of what they're dealing with. Because, you know, black unemployment seems to be one of those things that it's just there. Everyone just assumes, I guess, because they don't respect the humanity of black people, they don't appreciate the suffering that people are going through when they're out here trying to find jobs and there are no jobs available. And you wrote to that and you, you, uh, you laid out uh, your, the way you did your study, which, which was unscientific, we'll admit, but it was, it was convincing. And you basically showed, look, you showed what a lot of research has said that, that when white people show up with the same credentials as black people, black people are the last ones to get the jobs. And what I also found interesting is that, or, or I, I believe is that that's not going to change. <laughs> nope. White white people will probably continue to be white. That's that's a, I know that's a, such a deep statement, but and God bless them. Nobody hates them. Nobody's mad at them. But the fact is that they have a racial bias. They see us as a collective. We are seen as less than. When I live in Chicago, I see the north side of Chicago getting all kinds of investment and government money and everything. South side of Chicago gets left uh, in the dirt. Uh, north side of Chicago, everybody's safe and warm and happy. South side of Chicago, kids getting blown, get, getting their heads blown off every day. They don't care. And so to some extent, it almost seems that when we suffer, uh, no one's going to care. So we have to care. Yeah, and exactly. it almost seems to me also that that your answer to this was not to just just spend all your time feeling sorry for yourself. Although there were some, you know, I'm sure there were a lot of a lot of tears, a lot of tough days. Yes. Um, your response wasn't to continue to beg people who don't like you to give you an opportunity that you deserve. You went out on your own and you said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to create Michael Whitney. Uh, and I'm so proud of you for that. Now, I want to ask you this. Uh, the name of the company, Michael Whitney, I asked you, I said, I said, okay, who's Michael Whitney? T mm -hmm. Tell me, where did that come from? Oh, goodness. I'm so embarrassed, but I'll be brave to say... <laughs> Okay, <laughs> it comes from Michael Jackson and Whitney Houston, so I'm going to be honest. Really? Wow. Yes. 
I'm, I'm a big Michael Jackson fan. I respect his music and like Michael, everything he did was at a perfection level and I aim to do that with my clients. And also my son, his middle name is Michael. So in the back of my mind, I was going to name the business after my son, but then Whitney Houston had just died. Mm. And I said, you know what? Let me name the company Michael Whitney after these two great icons. And I did. And the reason why I named it like a masculine name is because when I would approach people for their business, they would always ask me like, what company are you with? Because if I say, if I said Yolanda Spivey, they were like, okay, yourself, like hang up the phone. They, they don't want to talk to me. Mm. But as soon as I said this masculine name, they were open to do business with me. And I'm like, that's so weird. So I just mm. kept it. I, I love the name. You know, were, you, know that me, you know what it reminds me of, Yolanda? It reminds me of that. Remember that Whoopi Goldberg movie in the 80s where Whoopi uh, was, you know, she was a brilliant investment analyst. And she, um, yes. you remember that? I don't remember what her previous job was, but she wanted to go in business for herself and no one would have meetings with her. So she literally created a white man named Mr. Cuddy yes. and, and made herself you know, the, a partner at Cuddy and Associates or something. And, and the company blew up, became worth millions of dollars. And everybody was like, we want to meet this Mr. Cuddy, who's clearly the genius behind this. They didn't know that Whoopi was the one who was coming up with all of this. So she literally got to the point where she was, you know, putting on a suit and dressing as a white man so that everybody could meet Mr. Cuddy, who was really just her. And, yeah. and, and it's funny. I, I, and I've seen that happen a lot. I've seen folks, uh, you know, start businesses where they will get a white woman, a white man to uh, to record their voice on the voice voicemail. I mean, yeah. just all these little tricks that that people have to play, and it's and it's unfortunate because you can't you cannot conclude that we're gonna we're, that we're doing all this masquerading and and ducking and dodging and creeping to just to survive and you and you can't argue that that doesn't affect our self-esteem at some point right that uh, that it's not telling us that who you are is not good enough you got to pretend to be a white guy in order for people to respect you and I, I remember going through that and i just decided you know i i don't think i'm ever going to be very good at being a white man and, and, and if, if if i am good at being a white man i'll never be as good at being a white man as white men already are at yeah. best i'll be uh, you know, the subpar substitute. And I said, you know what? I think maybe I could be a pretty good version of Boyce Watkins. That's let's, right. let, let's see what let's see what happens if I try that. And it, and it was rough. I mean, it ain't easy. Uh, it's volatile. It's tough, but it's so much fun. I mean, tell me this. Ask, uh, let me ask you this. Um, you know, st- having your own business, uh, if you take the, the financial part out of the equation, and you got to work, you got to pay the bills, stuff like that, uh, would you say, how would you compare your quality of life being your own boss to the quality of life you had when somebody else was your boss? Oh my goodness. Being my own boss was, it's, it's freeing. I would say that I feel free. Um, I can make my own hours. Although I, right now, my hours are everywhere. I work virtually <laughs> 24 7, seven days a week, but I don't care because it's mine, you know? Yes. But working for someone else, it was very depressing. I was chronically depressed working for corporate America for all those years. Mm -hmm. Um, Waking up, you have to be in the office by 9 or 8.30, 9 o'clock, you know, same old, same old. You have to deal with a lot of racism in um, in the office. A lot of black people are afraid to speak out against the racism that occurs inside, you know, our corporate America's offices. And then you go home and it's like you wasted the day and it's just depressing. It's stuck inside a cubicle or an office. It's it's not freeing. Mm, interesting. What well, you know, you're right about that. I mean, think about it like this. You know, your life is is a, a series of 24 hour days, yeah. and you know, so you get 365 days in a year. In a decade, you have 3,650 days. So over the course of say, um, you know, 50 years, uh, that's whatever 50 times. Uh, 36, uh, 50, 30. so so about uh, what was it, about twenty th- about two hundred thousand days is that right? Did I do that right? Two thousand twenty thousand. 
You're the mathematician. Something like that. Yeah, something like that. So, 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 you, so you've got all these days in your life that, that you live, and your life is nothing but a series of these days. And so if you really want to break down what you've spent your life doing, you can really do that by taking one day and chopping it into pieces. And you got to ask yourself, okay, what am I doing with that one day, like a piece of pie? Okay, eight hours of that day I'm, I spend sleeping approximately, maybe six to eight. So you pull that out, so you got 16 hours left. About 10 of those 16 hours are spent at work, getting ready for work, coming home from work, going to work, etc. And then if you work at home, that's e- eaten further into the pie. And then the rest of the time is spent, uh, you know, with in your personal life, whether you, you got children, uh, a mate, uh, friends, whatever, right? Watching Love and Hip Hop every night, whatever it is that you do, <laughs> you know. And so you got to ask yourself. If I've got 16 waking hours and I'm spending about 60 to 70 percent of those waking hours at a job and I hate that job, if the only reason I'm at that job is because I need a bigger paycheck, have I wasted my life? I mean, you know, imagine that. I mean, think about that idea of spending the majority of your life doing something that you hate, something you do not like doing. Yeah. That's crazy. You know, and, and if you're doing it just for the money, are you kidding me? So, so, and I understand people need money. We all need money. We all, you know, but what I think is that people sometimes they they choose their careers and their lives based on that one criteria: how much yeah. money am I gonna make? So, you know, and, and so what I love, and and I asked you that question. It was actually a kind of leading question about the freedom of entrepreneurship because I know exactly what you're talking about. You know, even when I don't make that much money, even when I wasn't making money, even when I was spending more money than far more than I was than I was making, um, I was so happy. I didn't care. Mm-hmm. I can work 12 hours a day, and I'm happy about it because yeah. it's fun. I'm doing what I want to do, and I'm working on my stuff. I'm not trying to build up Mr. Charlie's big business so that he can pay me <laughs> nickels and then he keeps all the money. I, I, it's mine, you know. Yeah. That's a it's an amazing feeling. So, um, yeah. okay, so so I want to finish up and ask you a couple more quick questions and I'll let you go because I know you're busy. You, you're a corporate woman, so you got stuff to do. <laughs> um, yep. and, and, and I want people to know first, first before we even move on, I'm going to remind them of this. Um, understand that we have to support each other. I think that all of us, you know, all of us runaway slaves who are running away from the corporate plantation, we got to stick together. We have to support each other. And I want people to go to your website. The website is mwhitney.com. That's M W H I T N E Y, just like Whitney Houston, mwhitney.com. And please go there and buy a policy because, because black people need insurance anyway. You know, in fact, if, if, if we were all properly insured, you wouldn't have Pookie and them doing a collection because so-and-so died and didn't leave anything for the kids or the family to bury that person. So um, yeah. so go, you know, meet meet with Miss Spivey. Let her help you with your insurance needs. She knows what she's talking about. She's also a very good person. I can vouch for that. And uh, in, a, in a really strong professional. So make sure you go to her site. Also, she has another site on Black Insurance News, and it's literally called Black Insurance insurancenews.com uh, I want you to go check that out as well now so the last question I want to ask you is specifically as it pertains to the black community um, you know what are some of the unique insurance issues that you've seen uh, with black people when it comes to our understanding of insurance uh, our desire to buy insurance etc oh, okay the unique circumstances this most times you know black people we can't and I'm not saying the you know a lot of us some of us know, but a lot of us cannot afford insurance. We just can't afford it. You know, our dollar, it doesn't stretch that far. But I would say this. If you can afford cable TV every month, you should have an insurance policy, especially a life insurance policy. Um, with life insurance, and I would like to talk about a little bit about that, just a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, life insurance, it, it let black people down back in the past because... And black people, they don't trust life insurance because back in the day, you'll have like a white salesman, life insurance salesman come into the black community and they have what they call these penny policies and black people will take their seven, it was like seven cents a week and they'll take their hard earned work money um, buying a policy for their spouse and if their spouse passes away and they try to collect on the premium, that insurance salesman will come back to them and say, well, you can't collect because of this clause in the policy or this clause in the policy. So it created a lot of distrust in the black community. 
And as a result, a lot of black people, as you see now, they just don't buy life insurance. So when grandma dies, everybody has a collection played out trying to, um, you know, gather up funds to buy, you know, pay for grandma's funeral costs. And I just saw a, a recent article of a young man who opened up a Kool-Aid stand in order to solicit funds to get um, to pay for his grandmother's funeral. Mm. Come on, people. We had, I mean, the insurance products, first of all, they can't play that anymore. The, um, the insurance industry can't jack you on your insurance. <laughs> so if you do buy a policy, it's a great investment. And that's, you know, on Black Insurance News, if you guys go there, you will see I write extensively on life insurance and why it's such a great tool to have. You guys can, you know, use life insurance to build wealth. You know, I know a young man who, um, he never knew his father. Never knew his father. He lived in a trailer home. And his father died and left him a, a gang of life insurance. And this boy was able to put himself through school. And now he's like a multimillionaire, you mm. know, just from a life insurance policy. So life insurance, it can create such a great... <sighs> It can create like a, it's a great tool for black people to utilize to create wealth within our communities. But black people do not buy life insurance. They just don't most times because we can't afford it. Mm -hmm. But there are some policies out there that is affordable and you just have to search for it. Call me. I'll hook you up. <laughs> you know, Okay. And, um, yeah, that's basically it, Doctor Boyce. Life insurance. Well, I love it. I love it, and and everybody needs to buy life insurance unless you think right. that you're not going to die. Exactly. And, and and that's unfortunate that we live life as if we're not going to die, even though all the evidence tells us that that is definitely going to happen. Exactly. And, and it's um you know so if you love your family, if you love your children, then you should have a life insurance policy, even a small one, so that you don't leave them with a lot of financial headaches to go along with the uh the severity of the loss of a loved one uh again and, and i'm sorry but if you don't do this then i it's hard for me, it's hard to, for, for you to convince me that you really love your kids and you yeah. love your family and, you know because if you leave them in that kind of hardship then shame on you I, that's uh, that's unacceptable and uh people need to go to mwhitney.com i'll uh, go talk to yolanda let her hook you up she will give you the hookup and uh also uh you know speak to her as a person that can educate uh, educate you and your family on the insurance needs that you might have and, and also go to blackinsurancenews.com because she talks a little bit about all everything that has to do with insurance and, and that's really just something that we have to really discuss as it pertains to wealth uh, because you not only want to build wealth but you want to protect your wealth and you want to protect the people you love so um, uh, so I want to say thank you so much for your time Yolanda I really appreciate it Thank you for having me. Yes, and, and we're going to do this again. This was so much fun, and, and we hadn't we hadn't talked face to face in a while, so this was actually this was great. This was great for me. Uh, so everybody, uh, thank you everybody for watching this. Uh, I appreciate your time. Uh, I'm Dr. Boyce Watkins from Financial Juneteenth. This is Yolanda Spivey at mwhitney.com, W-H-I-T-N-E-Y, mwhitney.com. Uh, and uh, please also visit Financial Juneteenth when you get a chance. We encourage black economic empowerment through financial literacy, entrepreneurship, and combating workplace discrimination. So until we meet again, please stay strong, be blessed, and be educated. We are gone. Peace.